to visit with the person of high strangeness, um, I would like for you to uh, push the button on your VCR and set this, uh, because we have a really interesting show for you today. Oops. We have a really interesting show for you today. Uh, one of the things in the news uh, in January of 2005 is the fact that there is an iceberg. It's a B-15A, and it is momentarily, uh, momentarily can mean several years maybe, uh, blocked uh, the McMurdo sound. And as a result of that, a lot of people got interested in icebergs. And um, it's right behind me here. It's, it's about the size of Long Island. And uh, but what it does, it, it's getting ready to slam into the mainland there. So we really don't know what it's going to do eventually. And did you push the button on your VCR like I asked you? Because we have an interesting show. The thing is here, uh, as of this time, we don't know what this iceberg is going to do to the mainland and how it's going to affect the Earth. And what does that have to do with uh, today's show? Well, I tell you what it has to do with today's show. Um, it is about genetically engineered food. And just like an iceberg, uh, we don't really know what it is going to do long term. And uh, just like an iceberg, uh, I'm going to show you the tip of the iceberg in the genetically engineered food. And then as time goes along, we will know what the long-term effect um, really is, uh, and in essence, how, uh, how that's going to work. Now, the, uh, the reason I ask you to be nice enough to push your button here is uh, because we have a really uh, for a really nice, what I call a forerunner of a documentary that is going to be released um, early in summer, March, April maybe, and it's called Bad Seed, The Truth About Genetically Engineered Food. So what we're going to do today, we're going to take part of the interviews from the documentary and introduce you to some of the friends um, that is on the documentary and um, give you a general idea what it is we're trying to say here. Now, whether the iceberg sits there for another 10 years or 20 years or slams into us immediately, uh, with all its beauty, eventually we will find out um, what the full range, uh, long-term effect of all of this is. And um, so the iceberg story is going to be kind of timeless in reference to, uh, uh, along with our genetically engineered food. We, we have a long clip. We're going to queue up for it. and. Um, Hope you push that button on your VCR and hope that you thoroughly enjoy um, this week's show. It's called Against the Grain. And uh, that's where we're going with it. That's another beautiful iceberg. And there's just so much beauty in what can be so dangerous and so deceiving. I want to thank my crew ahead of time in case we don't have time later. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and helping me uh, with that and all the people involved putting this together. So anytime we're ready, we can go to uh, the real subject of today's show, uh, mainly genetically engineered food. Enjoy. <laughs>
the best funded propaganda machine in the history of the planet. And just as in the Iraq war, where the New York Times was forced to admit that they published a series of lies about the reasons for going to war, similarly, they've been publishing lies about uh, biotechnology. We have the strange situation where U.S. food corporations are exporting GE-free food to Australia because people in Australia don't want to eat GE, and yet those same companies are providing GE food here in the U.S. because you don't have any labelling laws in the U.S., so the public are really denied the right to know and are denied the right to say no to genetically engineered foods. So the public here in the U.S. are really participating in a giant experiment with their health and with their environment without their knowledge and without their consent. I'm here because I don't believe that life should be patented. I believe that um, what has come from nature, our DNA, genes of life, have a right to live and, and perpetuate by themselves and don't need to be messed with or altered in any kind of way and especially don't need to be owned by corporations who are basically stealing the knowledge, indigenous knowledge of medicinal herbs and plants and patenting them and making a profit. And I don't agree with that. I, I think life is life and it doesn't belong to anybody. They don't think we're informed. I think that we're, they, I think they think that we're ignorant and just uh, that we don't know what we're talking about when in reality we've done a lot of research and we've read books and, you know, these, these facts are documented. We're the country that eats the most genetically modified food but knows the less. How is that? You know, the rest of the world knows a lot more than we do. Japan, European Union, they're, I mean, because they know what's going on, they have said no to GMOs and to genetic engineering. Okay. Whatever you can think of, it's pretty, there's a, the four most uh, genetic engineered foods are canola, soy, cotton, and corn. So, I mean, if you think about it, that's in almost everything we eat. And uh, it's really unfortunate because uh, we don't really know any long-term testing. We don't really have any concrete evidence that these products are safe to put out onto the market. And because the corporate... Because corporations have been such intertwined with the USDA, with, with our governmental agencies, they're basically the same people. They go from, you know, working with Monsanto to working with the USDA. There's, there's no separation, there's no way for us to make sure that our food is healthy. And I, and I think that there's a, there's a right for people to know what's in their food. And it's not labeled because people wouldn't make a profit off of it if, there, if it was. They would decide not to eat it. Or if you look at third world countries who are saying no 
those with genetically modified food aid. We see uh, USAID become the cop of the world with jumps on them, threatening to cop, cut off uh, food aid. Or you have Senator Press, who will introduce bills banning uh, AIDS medications to African countries who are saying no to GM food aid. So that is a symbol. What we just saw is a symbol of the oppression and a technology being shoved down the throats of people, especially when they don't want it, whether it's farmers or consumers or third world communities or communities right here in the United States of America. At Monsatano, we know that the health of your family is important which is why we have all of our products tested and get the U.S. government to approve them. A lot of the research that's used by the biotech industry for their claims for safety have been described by other scientists as rigged to avoid finding problems. They over-pasteurized milk 120 times longer than normal. They heated corn four and a half times more than normal before searching for intact protein. They used mature animals instead of young ones in feeding trials. They diluted their soy 10 to 1 before feeding it to the animals. They omitted the most incriminating research about differences in nutrients between the genetically modified soy and the non-genetically modified soy. The federal government is not ensuring that our food is healthy. The state government is not ensuring that our food is healthy. There is not an effective regulatory mechanism in place. The FDA does not require even to be notified by a biotech company if they're going to introduce a genetically modified crop. Although most companies say that they participate in a voluntary consultation in which they meet with an FDA person to discuss safety. They can show the summary data, choose what data they want to show, and they receive a letter from the FDA saying that the biotech industry company believes its own foods are safe. One company was an exception, that's Calgene. Calgene created the Flavor Saver tomato, designed for longer shelf life, although it's off the shelf so it didn't work, and they introduced it as the first genetically modified crop. So they asked the, the FDA to actually look at the detailed studies of a feeding trial. They fed the tomato to some rats. Actually, they force fed the tomato because the rats refused to eat it. Several developed stomach lesions. And if you read the actual documents from the FDA scientists, they said there are outstanding questions about safety related to these stomach lesions that have not been answered. And yet the FDA approved the flavor saver tomato. It also turns out that seven out of 40 rats died within two weeks after eating the genetically modified tomato and were replaced in the study without explanation. Recently it was found that rats that were fed genetically modified soy had misshapen cells in their livers and no research has been done to follow that up. In June of 2003, scientists reported that the gene sequence of the inserted genes into, into crops had actually changed their order. They had re-scrambled. So the genetic inserts are not stable. Another laboratory confirmed this and found that it had changed in the same varieties in different ways that they had tested. So not only is it unstable and changing, it's not even uniform in the way it's changing. This is incredibly dangerous. I would say that people who worry about the presence of pesticides and pesticide residues uh, uh, in their food ought to be very concerned about consuming genetically modified foods. A genetically modified food supplement called L-tryptophan was responsible for the deaths of about 100 Americans and caused 5 to 10,000 people to fall sick in the 1980s. The biotech industry claimed that the, the Japanese company that was genetically engineering its bacteria to produce this food supplement more economically, that that bacteria wasn't the problem, it was a change in the filter in early 1989. However, new information shows that hundreds of people got sick during the five, four years prior to the change in the filter. Now, what does this mean? It dismantles this alternative explanation and puts the blame squarely on genetic engineering. What's really a shame, however, is that the Food and Drug Administration of the United States knew this information and never went to the public with it. I got EMS because I ingested uh, what is believed to be genetically engineered strains of uh, L-tryptophan 
that was produced during one certain time period in 1989. And then it was withdrawn from the market in November of 89. Uh, when someone ingests uh, tryptophan made by Showa Dinko, uh, it happened that they had these astronomically high eosinophil, eosinophilia rates up in the thousands. So it would almost be like being allergic to something only you know, thousands of times over, um, which, if you look at it even further, is just basically sort of what a poisoning would be. You know, if you're poisoned by something, your body's rejecting it, and, and it's a foreign matter. So um, the body just saw the L-tryptophan as a, as a toxin and reacted to it as if it was a toxin and a and tried to rid itself of the, the body tried to rid itself of it with the eosinophils. So in some cases, the eosinophils won out in the beginning and, and managed to um, uh, at least keep people alive and get past the, the acute stage. And in some cases, uh, people reacted so strongly to the eosinophils that they died I mean, almost automatically from the amount that they took, whether it was large or small. Before I got M EMS, I was a 39-year-old woman who was working for the Defense Intelligence Agency as an um, intelligence officer. I was married, and I had a small child who was five years old. Um, I had completed 10 years of college, uh, primarily all in African studies and political science. So it had taken me that long to sort of uh, carve my path into that career. And I felt like I had finally found a career that I liked and I enjoyed and liked the people I worked with. And, you know, I had found my, my niche in life. Uh, I tried to avoid it. Uh, any sort of genetically engineered food. I don't trust it. I don't... I don't know what it will do to me ultimately. I have a strong feeling that, like with the tryptophan, I think a human body knows what it's supposed to be allowed to ingest and what it knows is harmful to it and uh, it will respond accordingly so I don't want to put anything in my body that I think my body would rather reject than accept <laughs> but I, I still uh, liken genetic material to uh, poison I mean, like, real poison. Because after I got EMS, I, for a short, very short period, when I still had a little bit of energy, I went to a medical library and researched some different types of poisonings, and I read up on nerve gas poisonings and organic pesticide poisonings, and the symptoms were identical, all identical to the things that I was experiencing at the time, everything. The muscle contractures, the, the, the highs, the hair loss, uh, just everything was identical. So to me, it's just, if you're genetically engineering something, you're creating something that doesn't exist in nature. Monsatano sets the standard for agriculture with technology that is changing the way farmers do business. Farmers got sold. Farmers have bought into biotechnology, uh, especially in the Midwest, uh, especially where they farm on an industrial scale, because they've been indoctrinated by the industry 
and its ally, the Land Grant College, the Land Grant University, for about five or six decades. That industry, born after World War II, started a systematic indoctrination of farmers all over the country in the 1950s. It was one of the most successful uh, cultural education programs in the history of this country. And it convinced farmers that the way to go is to apply pesticides, apply herbicides, farm with chemicals. Better farming through chemistry, if you will, was the message they were delivering. Farmers bought it. The environmental impact of genetically engineered crops uh, is claimed by the industry to be beneficial. Uh, the fact is, however, that what biotechnology does in agriculture uh, is reduce biodiversity, which is one of the key ingredients uh, in a healthy ecosystem. And of course, a healthy agriculture depends on a healthy ecosystem. They're after a quick fix. Uh, they're after a single solution. They're after the fastest dollar they can make on finding these uh, quick solutions. Uh, when you ask me about um, how I feel in uh, light of the kind of glib promises uh, made by the universities and by the industry um, as, as contrasted with generations of experience uh, by farmers who know the land and know the crops, um, I respond with a, a mix of... Uh, great sadness uh, and anger. Um, the sadness uh, comes because um, I know the consequence is the, the loss of uh, the beauty and the complexity and the reliability of an agriculture that depends on the health of the farm uh, the health of the ecosystem that supports the farm, and the health of the economy that supports both. Um, my anger is about the exploitation of farmers, about the taking advantage of farmers. Farmers where I grew up in Nebraska are still making about the same amount of money. They're still being paid about the same amount of money for a bushel of corn that they were 40 years ago. Um, Treating farmers that way, treating farmers as um, uh, a disposable resource where we can casually discount their importance in this culture, um, pisses me off. Um, and uh, the consequence of that is, uh, in the long term, uh, devastating for the land and for people. I know is what I've either done wrong or seen go wrong. I have a lot of hands-on experience. Um, first of all, I don't buy the, uh, the story that the genetically modified companies are putting out, that they're trying to do all these good things for us with genetic modifications. <clears throat> they tout how they're going to develop beta-carotene-enhanced 
food so that they can solve blindness problems in, in third world countries. Um, to me, that would be easier to nutritionally improve something than it would to make it tolerant to a uh, poison like glyphosate that is designed to kill everything. Um, I don't buy it for a second. I feel that it's all about control and money and power from their part. Um, I don't I don't know how many people realize it, but there's kind of a neat circle in the uh, pharmaceutical and, and crop production chemical business. If you look and do a little homework, you'll find that pretty well all the companies that are in the uh, pharmaceutical business, Bayer, uh, Upjohn Pharmacy, uh, BASF, all of them are also in the crop production business. And it's, and, and I certainly hope that they're not, this isn't a plan from a financial standpoint in any boardroom in, at any place in time, but it, it's more than a coincidence that, okay, if we put something on the crop that has an ill effect to the soil and to the crop, and it affects what we feed the livestock, and we ultimately feed the people, and the people get sick, and they go to the doctor, and they got it. Then they need to go to the pharmacist and get a prescription. Kind of makes a complete circle for what's going on with uh, one of our crop production customers who has a dairy, and he uses strictly non-GMO crops, and he also is following the guidelines to where he's gotten rid of all the chemical residues in the soil with our crop production program. And he shares machinery with two other small dairy people because none of them are big enough to have their own setup, so they, they neighbor and share on the deal. And the one gentleman does not, is not able to raise his own crops. Um, he buys it from a neighbor and it's, it's either BT or Roundup Ready, or it's always something GMO. And he said he's having such a time with the herd health on his cows. And both of the other gentlemen uh, are using both non-GMO and our crop production program, and they don't have the herd health problems that the other gentleman's experiencing. So it, there's... There's no question in my mind that uh, the GMOs are doing more for the, the seed companies that are selling them and collecting the technology fee than they are for the producers. They, um, one thing that is very disturbing from the aspect of the Roundup Ready soybean, there's something called mosaic virus that has shown up in the soybeans the last several years and it's spread from bean to bean by the bean leaf beetle. The bean leaf beetle uh, picks it up from a soybean plant that it feeds on, chews on, and then carries it to, spreads it to basically all the soybeans that it bites. Well, they're, regardless of what you're raising, um, we quite often will raise some food grade soybean and the mosaic virus is a virus that is found in cauliflower. And that virus is purposely injected into every Roundup Ready soybean on the market. They use it as a tracer or an identifier to see that they have the, the Roundup Ready gene present. And the Colorado State University used to have a website, I don't know if they still do, that explained how the genetically modified process was the step-by-step -step how it happened. And the mosaic virus, it was right on their website that the mosaic virus is put in every Roundup Ready soybean on the market. And this causes deformation or modeling as it's, as it's referred to of the bean. It causes them to shrivel up. It will abort some of the beans from the pods. Um, and hurts yield and nutritional quality of the soybeans. And I think it's very unfair that 
someone that's trying to raise a food grade soybean for a specific market has to suffer the consequences of Monsanto's irresponsibility in putting the mosaic virus in as a tracer. If they would do and research and prove that everything was good, like they claim, it would, I'd be all for it. But, you know, the, the revolving door story about how the, the government officials have gone from the biotech companies to the EPA to the FDA as the approval process goes. The Secretary of Agriculture we have right now used to work for a subsidiary company of Monsanto. So what's she going to say about uh, genetically modified crops? It's kind of a no-brainer. So there's, uh, it's all about big money as far as I'm concerned. It's not about what's right and, and value. Among Satano, we are at the front lines in the battle against hunger. We are making sure that even the most remote corner of the globe is using our patented crop system. I'm Kathy McAfee. I'm the director of Food First. Our long name is Institute for Food and Development Policy. And we've been working for nearly 30 years now to uh, confront the root causes of hunger in the world. And we were founded uh, nearly 30 years ago by people who began to realize that what they'd been told about hunger in school in the United States was completely wrong. We've been told that we are the greatest and most efficient producer of food in the world, that our food keeps starvation at bay in the rest of the world, that the rest of the world depends upon us and that we need to export more food and give more food aid in order to end hunger. What we found out was that, in fact, U.S. food exports in particular, and also exports from Canada and European countries that are sold uh, abroad and even given away abroad are actually a greater cause of hunger than they are a solution. So our uh, organization uh, publishes materials, does speaking, does research. We're a people's think tank, working in coalition with farmers' organizations, non-government organizations, all over the world, working to end hunger by dealing with the root causes. Well, I do know something about biotechnology and genetic engineering in particular. I've been teaching about this at uh, Yale in the United States for some years. I've been, before that, I uh, was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California doing research on uh, biotechnology. The root causes of hunger certainly uh, are not uh, lack of food or lack of knowledge about how to grow food among farmers in countries where people are hungry. The root cause of hunger is inequality, inequality in access to land and other food producing resources, inequality in wealth, inequality in control of political power. And that's the kind of problem that we are trying to focus on that people all over the world are focusing on in trying to uh, win the right to food and the right to feed oneself and to acquire a healthy diet uh, without having to depend upon food aid. One of the things that I've found and that other people who have looked into this have found is, first of all, that genetically engineered crops have not been designed to produce more food. Uh, they've been engineered with the aim of producing seeds that either will grow in spite of being sprayed with a pesticide or seeds that actually produce pesticides in every cell of the plant. These are the kinds of genetically engineered crops that have actually been produced commercially worldwide. And it's not surprising that this is the case because in this country and worldwide, 
there's a lot of overlap and consolidation between agrochemical companies that produce the fertilizers and the herbicides and the insecticides uh, that produce and sell the seeds and increasingly the companies that buy the products, process the products, sell the, the, the grains um, worldwide. We shouldn't unleash uh, this massive experiment on huge numbers of farmers and consumers throughout the world in the absence of knowing what it's going to do. If it were a matter of life and death and survival, the risk might be worth it. But it's not a matter of life and death and survival. It may be a matter of life and death and survival for Monsanto and a few other chemical companies, but for most of us it isn't. We can, grow perfect, we can eat perfectly good food without having it genetically modified. And these companies promise that uh, in Africa and other parts of the third world, they'll be able to solve the problems of starvation and hunger by means of these crops. Well, if they could actually do that, rather than claim that they might be able to do it in the future, there'd be probably be less argument about it. But the fact is that uh, at the moment, this is simply a propaganda point that they make to try and justify the technology, claiming to be caring about poor people. Actually, uh, they've put almost no effort into caring about poor people. Their whole effort has been put into getting richer themselves. So um, I see no reason why we should have an experiment inflicted upon us uh, by companies whose only aim is profit um, on this massive scale. It's not worth taking any risks at all on a massive scale uh, if there's no benefit associated with them. The calculus of risk and benefit in this case comes down in favor of avoiding the risks and sticking with what we know and trust, namely regular plants produced by regular plant breeding. In May of 1998, my organization, the Alliance for Biointegrity, a, a nonprofit public interest group, uh, organized a lawsuit against the United States Food and Drug Administration. And uh, it was an unprecedented suit in that uh, it combined as plaintiffs many uh, eminent scientists along with eminent religious leaders, all of whom had objections to the FDA's policy on genetically engineered food. The most significant objections were those of the scientific plaintiffs. There were nine of them. And these individuals challenged the FDA's claim that genetically engineered foods are recognized as safe by an overwhelming consensus within the scientific community because they themselves disagreed with that. They felt that the FDA claimed that these genetically engineered foods are so similar to their conventionally produced counterparts that they can be presumed to be just as safe and require not one bit of testing at all. These scientists knew that uh, from a scientific standpoint that is a very unsound uh, position, that genetic engineering is inherently hazardous and it entails the uh, potential for creating many unexpected disruptions to the functioning of the food yielding organism. During the course of the lawsuit, the FDA was required to give us copies of all of their internal documents relevant to the policy they had made on genetically engineered foods. That meant we got over 44,000 pages of documents. Going through those documents was quite a revelation because it was clear even before our lawsuit started that our nine, the nine scientists who had signed on as our plaintiffs were certainly not the only nine scientists who had grave concerns, serious doubts about genetically engineered food. But many such scientists were not U.S. citizens. They couldn't be uh, plaintiffs. And many who were U.S. citizens uh, for uh, concern over tenure in their university or getting grants uh, were a little concerned about signing on. Getting nine was really something. But well, we knew there were hundreds and hundreds. What we didn't know was that among the scientists who have concerns about the safety of genetically engineered foods and who believe that the FDA's policy of not, subject, not requiring that they're subjected to safety testing, that among those scientists were essentially most of the scientists at the FDA's own staff. What we found when we looked at the FDA's documents is 
that their own experts, their own scientific experts, had written memo after memo in the, the months preceding the FDA's issuance of its policy statement of May of 1992, stating very, very clearly that as a matter of sound science, genetic engineering had to be viewed as inherently different than traditional breeding, and that it did have the potential to uh, create many unintended, potentially harmful side effects. And, as I've said before, uh, they also said, they, they said very clearly in their memos, because of the potential for unintended, harmful side effects of genetic engineering, that every genetically engineered food has to be subjected to long-term testing, and that the whole food should be employed. During the lawsuit, the FDA admitted in their legal arguments, they admitted that they are not regulating the biotechnology industry at all. They did that so they could evade having to follow the uh, National Environmental Protection Act because they also were, should have been doing environmental assessments of all of these products. But to get around that requirement, they argued that they are not regulating the biotech industry at all. And as a matter of procedural law, that let them off the hook of following the Environmental Protection Act and doing the assessments. But it was clear they, they were not. But now we have the FDA admitting in black and white. Of course, unfortunately, in public, they continue to try to uh, convey the impression they are regulating. And the biotech industry and the media purvey that impression to the public. So most people think the FDA is on the job and regulating the industry whereas they themselves admit they are not. Now, I have mentioned that the FDA top bureaucrats clearly were uh, keen and actually overly keen, bending over backwards to support the biotech industry. Um, one indication of this, and the extent to which the FDA went to have the industry's, the industry's agenda represented rather than their own scientific staff's wisdom and knowledge was happened in the summer of 1991. They took on board, they created, actually the FDA created a new position, Deputy Commissioner for Policy. And the primary first job of that Deputy Commissioner for Policy was to oversee and finalize the policy on genetically engineered foods. Now who was it that gets appointed to such a very powerful and sensitive position? Was it somebody with great scientific background? No. It was a, a Washington attorney who was a partner in a very high-powered law firm who was representing Monsanto and also the biotechnology industry. He, he, he knew what, bio, what Monsanto wanted. He knew what the biotech industry wanted. And he was brought over to the FDA. And while deputy commissioner, it, uh, I don't think it's an accident that the policy that came out covered up the FDA's scientific concerns and basically gave Monsanto and the industry everything they could have wanted, and probably even more so. No need to test the foods at all. The FDA claiming that they're safe. The FDA essentially promoting them for you. Now, after having basically performed so well uh, for the biotech industry, giving them what they really wanted, this individual, whose name is Michael Taylor, at Eventually, he got hired directly by Monsanto as a vice president for public policy. And he served, uh, he served in the Washington office of Monsanto at that capacity. So he went from being an, a private lawyer representing Monsanto as outside counsel to deputy commissioner of policy for the FDA. And after having set the policy favorable to Monsanto at the FDA, got hired directly by Monsanto to be vice president for policy against the law to be letting these foods on the market when it's clear they're not generally recognized as safe and therefore they're on the market illegally. And that's a point that could not be emphasized strongly enough. Every genetically engineered food 
that has come to market in the United States has come to market against the clear, the clear mandates of federal food safety law. Every one of these foods is on the market illegally. Arthur Anderson was the consultant for Monsanto and asked the uh, leaders in Monsanto to describe their ideal future in 15 to 20 years. The Monsanto executives described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds were genetically modified and patented. And Arthur Anderson worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. engineering of food concerns me a lot in this country because I don't think most Americans are even aware of it and even when they're made aware of it they don't seem that bothered by it you know it's, it, and again it goes back to the old you know it can't happen to me or so what or you know it, it's already probably uh, being genetically engineered and I'm not dead yet so why why it care or whatever it's hard to get people here riled up about such things um, my daughter went to school in England for a short while and we visited there a number of times and uh, just as an example people in England I mean there was an article in the newspaper almost daily while it, you know anytime we went there no matter what year it was on genetic engineering and they're much more attuned to it and much more um, uh, active about it uh, so I mean I really don't know what it would take even the accident with the tryptophan didn't really seem to affect anybody because it was such a small group of people you know proportionate to the United States population that people don't see it as a threat and I have discussions all the time with actual friends of mine where I've actually been in a store with friends of mine who will be lifting something off the shelf, like ephedra, you know, went back when it was causing all the problems and saying, what are you doing, you know? Don't you know what this drug does? And they will, they'll say, well, you know, it's not, I'm not worried about it or, you know, it, it hasn't bothered me or this, that, and the other, so I don't know what you can do. I mean, these are people who know I've been poisoned and yet they still don't see a problem. Or buy 
5-HTP or melatonin, which has been proven to have the same poison that I took and is on the market right now, and I've told my friends not to buy it, and they'll still buy it knowing that I've been poisoned. So I don't know what else you can do other than, you know, die right in front of them. It's not responsible to feed the products of this infant science to millions of people or release them in the environment where they can never be recalled. When independent scientists look at the research data that supposedly presents an argument for food safety, they're appalled. They said these foods should never be approved. We need to get these foods off the market, and this will take a concerted effort. One thing that we have going for us is this. Studies show that the more people learn about genetically modified crops, the less they trust them, the less they're willing to experiment in their own bodies by eating them. So we need to get the information out to consumers about genetic modification. So even if the government won't budge, even if the government is in bed with the biotech industry, we can still topple this dangerous industry. And that is by rejecting eating genetically modified foods. When consumers were concerned about genetically modified foods in Europe, Unilever, Britain's largest food manufacturer, in April of 1999, said they're going to take all GM ingredients out of their European brand. Within a week, every major food company, McDonald's, Burger King, Safeway, all said they were going to do the same thing for their European brands because the European consumers were concerned, but they left their genetically engineered ingredients in their U.S. brands. More and more, there are brands in the United States that are removing genetically engineered foods. The brands at Whole Foods and Wild Oats and Trader Joe's are not genetically engineered. Gerber baby food is now supposedly not genetically engineered. Frito-Lay tells its farmers not to plant GMOs, although they can't guarantee that their products don't contain GMOs. We need to put pressure on manufacturers saying, your product used to be my favorite food, but no longer. And it will again when you tell me that there's no genetically modified ingredients. We should put the uh, pressure on them, on the restaurants, on the, on the schools, uh, food lunch programs, so that we don't have to eat these dangerous foods. And this economic pressure could topple the industry. I got There's that iceberg I was talking about. Is it going to hit the mainland? Um, yes, it probably is. Um, I have a neighbor, and uh, she has children that is highly allergic, and uh, I shared that with her. Um, please make sure what you tape today, you, you will show it to your friends, and so um, we can, you know, get the word out and educate people a little bit about this. Um, corn and grain has been sacred to uh, Native Americans, and. Uh, and it's the basics for uh, uh, many of our diets. And um, behind me here, this is a, a, a picture that the Navajos painted of all the sacred corn. The, uh, we're going to end the show today with um, some Butu dancers from um, the Evergreen College in Olympia, Washington. And uh, they will kind of summarize a little bit. Now, all the uh, credentials of the people you saw on the clip today you can reach by going to the website www.highstrangeness.tv and um, it is there you can uh, find the uh, mo more information on the people talking also. 1992, Grolier Encyclopedia Work of Knowledge has a lot of information on uh, genetically engineered food, how it works, how long it's been, ex and how long it has been into a systems and um, so the only thing the only other thing I could think of you know is like sometimes we go on vacation or we go to town for the day and we forget to put some food away and we come home and we just see a pot is just bubbling and it's just really gross and you say ooh what is that well it's fermenting and I would hate to think that um, some of the some extent we have would eventually ferment so every time you you want to buy some genetically engineered food, just see that part all just fermenting and bubbly. And so
smelling really sour and that's not a nice thought. I should put you in positive space, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'll take you to the Bhutu dancers and come see us next week um, where, we'll where we will uh, join another program with you. And again, thank you for videotaping and give it to all your friends. And thank you for your support. It took a lot of people to put this together. Here we are, you have a good week. Bhutu um, dancers of um, at the Evergreen College in Olympia, Washington. Enjoy.